Hi everyone, this is Dr. Mondal. Welcome to this online video for English 314 Literature and Gender for Friday, September 22nd, 2017. Unfortunately, I am not able to be on campus today. Um, I got an injury yesterday and need to get it checked out today um, and uh, am unable to drive to campus uh, because of this injury. So unfortunately, uh, I'm sad to say that I can't be with you in class. Um, but in lieu of that, I'm creating a lecture, sharing some of the materials that I would have wanted to share with you in class. And then the remainder of the class time will be enough for you to do an activity on Blackboard, which involves close reading. Um, and so that will substitute for today's 50 minute class. So the general theme of this lecture is Thread's activity on Wilkie Collins' The Moonstone. What you'll need as you listen to this lecture, and feel free to just pause it if you need to and gather these materials, you'll need your class notes, you'll need your copy of the Moonstone, and you'll want to access our course Blackboard page. And if you click on week four, you'll be able to see the discussion board, which I will walk us through uh, when I get to the appropriate place in the video. So before we proceed to talking about the threads activity, I just want to do a brief recap from last time. Last time we talked about academic integrity and there were some particular points that we discussed with regard to this uh, theme. And as you know, we still have to do the academic integrity exam, uh, which is a simple five question multiple choice exam that we'll go, we'll go ahead and do that on Monday. Um, but just to review, I think the more that you see this, the easier the exam is because you remember these things. We talked about how if you are using anything that is the exact words from another source, you want to put quotation marks around the words that are taken from the original source and use a parenthetical citation so that your reader knows what, uh, where that came from, what page it was from. If you want to paraphrase something, you're basically putting into your own words what the original quotation says. It is plagiarism if you copy the exact words from the source without quotation marks, because paraphrasing is putting it in your own words, or plagiarism is if you copy the sentence structure of the original. So if the sentence structure is exactly the same and you just change a few words and, and put synonyms in, words that mean the same thing, you've still got the same sentence structure. You're t still taking that person's writing. Um, so that is plagiarism. You need to make sure to put it entirely in your own words, change the sentence structure, don't just replace a few words with your own language. And even if you're paraphrasing, you do want to cite the source since you are explaining somebody else's idea. We talked about square brackets. That's when you're adding something to the quotation. Square brackets go inside the quotation marks because you're adding something to the original quotation and you're indicating that something was added here that was not in the original. The ellipsis is used to indicate that something has been taken out of the quotation. So those three periods basically say something was here and it's been taken out. So both the square brackets and the ellipsis are most often used for clarification purposes. You're trying to clarify what a pronoun like he or she or it is responding or uh, is referring to, for example, um, or you're adding something for clarification. Even if you are using the square brackets or the ellipsis, your sentence should remain grammatically correct and you don't want to change the meaning of the original text by using either of those. So on the exam that we'll have, uh, you'll have an, uh, a question using square brackets and ellipsis and you're going to want to make sure that the ellipsis does not change the meaning of the sentence and you're going to want to make sure that those square brackets are in a quotation around something that has been added that was not in the original. Um, also, you want to make sure that if you get written feedback during a writer's workshop, and we will have several of these, you don't want to use your colleagues' same words. That counts as plagiarism. You'll want to put the idea entirely in your own words and also expand on it if possible. Um, add something to it that was not uh, what was in the original by elaborating more or explaining in a little bit more depth. Finally, 
You want to avoid uh, copying and pasting or purchasing a paper from the internet. Um, that's never acceptable. I know this is obvious <laughs> for everyone, but that constitutes plagiarism. It is always plagiarism. And if that happens, I will have to report the incident and give you a zero for the assignment. So just keep these points in mind. Uh, review them if, if you need to before Monday when we will have uh, the academic integrity exam. I also want to recap from last time uh, some course terms that were introduced, and I want to add a little bit of new information. So last time we talked about something called miscegenation, and we were thinking about the character of Ezra Jennings in particular. Um, and as you know uh, from the additional reading that you've done from the novel, Ezra Jennings uh, has an encounter with Franklin Blake and explains to Franklin, you know, my mother was born in one of our uh, colonies, one of the British colonies. He doesn't specify which one it is, um, but he is of mixed race. He's of mixed parentage. And the term uh, that we use to talk about that um, kind of relationship is miscegenation, which can refer to a child born out of an interracial union. It can refer to interracial sex, um, but the term that kind of carries all of that is miscegenation. And I had shared during last class that people who were of mixed race were viewed as somehow um, sullying or staining or um, introducing impurities to what was prized by the culture during this period as a, quote, pure racial line. Um, and this is very troubling and problematic thinking because it's essentially white supremacy. Um, but this is, in fact, something that was widespread as an attitude during the Victorian period. And I want you to know that because it helps you to make sense of how the other characters regard Ezra Jennings um, and why it is that he's perceived as someone who is weak, someone who is inferior uh, by some of the other characters. So I just wanted to add some terminology that you can use to talk about or think about this. Um, John McBratney is a Victorian scholar. He's an English professor um, at John Carroll University, actually, here in Ohio. Um, he has a book titled Imperial Subjects, Imperial Space, Rudyard Kipling's Fiction of the Native Born. And in that book, he talks about precisely what we're discussing here, vic late Victorian perceptions of racial mixture, of miscegenation. And he talks about how during the Victorian period, there are many people who were open to the idea of mingling. Mingling meaning um, interacting with people of other races in social situations, gaining cultural knowledge, studying languages, doing what we might call pulling a Mirthwaite, right? Where Mirthwaite sort of, uh, quote, disguises himself as an Indian and goes in to India in a way that, uh, you know, is, is not at all suspected uh, in terms of his being a European. He's able to, you know, disguise himself and, and go in there, find out things, etc. Those are all examples of mingling, of being able to mingle with, uh, quote, natives um, or colonized people is, is what they actually are. They're being, in terms of power, they're being colonized by the British um, with acceptable, um, an acceptable kind of social uh, perception around those interactions. Mixing, however, involves sexual contact, intimacy, and that was considered unacceptable. So you can see, you can definitely see that line uh, in the text where, um, for example, you've got Murthwaite who's mingling with Indians and interacting with them on a social level, and he is considered an eminent traveler, right? He's considered someone who is very respected. Whereas you have Ezra Jennings, a product of a mixed race sexual union, who is considered to be degraded, who's considered to um, be someone of, of unworthy, unsavory character. Um, so this mixing versus mingling thing can kind of help us to make sense of the different attitudes around race that we see coming out in the novel. I had also mentioned last time that there were some uh, really peculiar and problematic ideas about mixed race uh, people in the late 19th century. Um, I talked about you know, some of the perceptions of them that they were inferior because they had sullied the quote pure Anglo-Saxon racial line. And 
uh, we talked a little bit about how such characters were perceived in terms of whether they were considered to be white or not. And I made a comparison to the United States context where you might be familiar with the one drop rule, the notion that if anyone had any African ancestry, they were considered to be not white. Um, and I said a similar thing happened in the British imperial context, specifically in India. So basically, if you had a mixed race character like Ezra Jennings, um, the prevailing thinking during this period was that they would have some traits that would be considered above average, that would be considered exemplary due to the uh, Anglo-Saxon sort of parentage or the whiteness in their in their blood. Um, and that so they would be able to to show some of those quote superior characteristics but that because they were of mixed race, because they had a quote, I'm using scare quotes around all of these terms, a quote, inferior racial line, that at the end of the day, regardless of you know what superior traits they may have displayed, they would always, always sort of get in their own way and the quote, inferior bloodline would come out somehow. This was called regression or reversion. The idea that somebody would always quote, regress to their quote, lesser racial type. Um, that was the thinking. So you can kind of see how this traps mixed race characters into a game that they can never win, because if they do something that is praised, that's considered valuable, that's considered worthy, it's attributed to the whiteness and their parentage. And then whenever they might make a mistake, which people will inevitably do, the idea that follows them regardless of you know what they did or, or how hard they're trying is oh of course you did because you're half you know whatever um, half the thing that's not white in their parentage um, so this was a very unfortunate sort of trap um, that that people were caught in in terms of other people's perceptions of them I want you to think about that with regard to Ezra Jennings and the way again that he's perceived he's not perceived the same by everybody Franklin Blake for example has a very different perception of him than some of the other characters in the text um, so I want us to think about what Collins is doing there in terms of maybe making it visible um, that there are these attitudes about regression and reversion and uh, uh, miscegenation and, you know, maybe evaluate what is he doing after he exposes that. So that's the material from last time that I wanted to just add a little bit to, and I hope that that was helpful for you. Now I want to move on to the activity that I introduced in a sort of preliminary way during our last class. I had told you that doing the threads activity was a way to test out an idea. So if you have a theme in mind, a thread in mind, a critical question in mind that you have started to become curious about in the text, um, this activity allows you to explore that without having to write a full paper about it. And you can kind of test out your idea and see if this is something that you actually want to uh, pursue in a draft. So the steps are picking that theme or thread or critical question, then picking, we talked about a minimum of five passages that relate to that idea, to that topic, and doing close reading brainstorming for each of those five passages. After you've done that, you're going to be able to see some patterns in your analysis and to come up with a claim or a thesis uh, for your paper based on that close reading and it never goes backwards you never have a thesis first and you cram your close reading into that close reading is a process of discovery you dig deeper into the text find its deeper meaning and once you do that you know something you didn't know before so the thesis can never come before doing all of the analysis the analysis is your way to answer your question and then after you've got your analysis of the five passages, you come up with a tentative claim, an argument that seems to fit what you discovered in your analysis. Then you think about, okay, what is the relevant context that I might need to add uh, to my paper somewhere so that all of this stuff will make sense to the reader? So if you're writing about Ezra Jennings, for example, all the stuff that I said about miscegenation and late Victorian attitudes towards interracial mixture, etc., would be very relevant for you, right? Um, and also any insights from your literary criticism, you can put that to the side now because as you know, you're not engaging literary criticism until next week. But eventually you're gonna to wanna to think about how the person whose work you've read um, helps to enrich um, what you're saying. 
And then you go into the drafting process. You start by writing your body paragraphs, actually writing them out using your brainstorming. Um, and after you've written your body paragraphs, you tailor your thesis or your claim so that it fits the analysis that you've actually written. So we are going to talk about the first two of these steps in this lecture. So to do the threads activity, it is possible to do this and have a very bad <laughs> outcome. So I'd like to show you um, some examples of ways to do this that are not so helpful and ways to do this that will make sure that you're on the right track. So step one, you, you want to identify that theme, thread, or critical question on a topic of interest in the novel. So a sample of theme, thread, critical question that, that would not be helpful for you is if in this, for this step, if you wrote gender roles. The reason why that's not a good theme is it's way too general. Are you talking about gender roles for women? If so, are you talking about middle class, working class? Are you talking about gender roles for men? Same question about class. Are you talking about particular characters? Are you talking about particular parts of the novel? Um, this stuff is, is just way, way too general. And what's going to happen is in step two, when you have to pick five passages, if your theme is way too general, your five passages might be very disconnected. And it's going to be difficult to find a thesis that can account for such varied passages. So you want to avoid that. Another thing that's not helpful is Victorian times. <laughs> when you are analyzing one literary work, it is always a bad idea to try to come up with a claim that accounts for the entire literary period. And the Victorian period was a very long period, right? Queen Victoria just lived for a very, very long time. So we're talking about like 1830s until 1901. That's a lot of decades. And a novel that was published in 1868, one of thousands of novels probably published in England during the Victorian period is not going to give you an argument that can account for the entire era, right? So try to avoid uh, things like that. And then another thing that's not helpful is something like character development or symbolism or irony. Those are literary terms, and I'm not saying those terms aren't interesting, but they're not actually uh, an area of focus in the text. They're not a theme. Um, they're not a question. They're just literary terms. So if you did something like character development, you might have five examples of some sort of character development, but again, they're going to be very disparate. There's not going to be anything kind of connecting them together. And your, your thesis is just not going to emerge from that. So I recommend avoiding these kinds of things for that first step. Instead, you want to do something like a depiction of middle class versus working class women. Okay you can find really solid examples of that and see what's going on here. How is Collins portraying these two groups of women? What does that tell me um, about what he's suggesting uh, about the, the contrast? You could have contrasts between Indian versus English traits. Again, something very specific, something that is a thread that can be followed throughout the text, and you know exactly what kinds of passages you're looking for. Portrayal of racial otherness, this is another example. This is still pretty broad in the sense that you might be talking about Indians. You might be talking about uh, Mr. Luker, for example, Septimus Luker. Um, you might be talking about Ezra Jennings. We don't know uh, what his mother's parentage is. so. He may or may not be half Indian. It could be something else. Um, but still, you might find some consistencies or some important differences, but it's not too broad. You can still manage that. Depiction of women's versus men's desire. You might think about, for example, Rosanna's desire for Franklin, Franklin's desire for uh, Rachel, maybe the um, kind of uh, in, inexplicable desire Franklin uh, seems to have for Ezra Jennings where he's like drawing his face over and over and he can't get him out of his mind. Um, there were a couple of small groups that commented on the sort of desiring relationship between um, Limping Lucy and uh, Rosanna, even though Rosanna may not have reciprocated that, we don't really know. Um, but those are some examples of ways that you can kind of trace um, different desiring relationships. It's pretty specific, right? It's, it's not super unwieldy where there's too, too much. So you want to be a little bit more specific. You don't want to be too vague. You don't want to try to make an argument about the entire era using just one novel. Um, you don't want to use literary terms. 
So let's go into step two. That's list a minimum of five passages relevant to what you articulated in step one. And then for each passage, include close reading of specific words and phrases in the quotation. So close reading, you're analyzing deeper meaning of specific words and phrases. Close reading is not simply repeating or restating or describing what is in the quotation. Your reader can read the quotation. They already know what it says. So just restating it is not helping. It's not providing analysis. You also don't want to discuss surface level obvious insights without deeper meaning. So for example, if a character is saying something sarcastically, simply observing that they're using sarcasm that is probably obvious to the reader, right? It's a surface level insight that there's sarcasm there. Say more about what the sarcasm means. So what does it reveal about what they're saying? What does it reveal about the relationship between the characters who are speaking to each other? What does it reveal about maybe the author's uh, perspective? If you feel like Collins is exert exerting a little bit of authorial commentary there, you don't wanna just observe that it's there. You wanna ask, what is it doing? You want to discuss, avoid, excuse me, you want to avoid discussing the quotation generally without analyzing specific words and phrases. So don't just say in this passage we see X, Y, and Z, but there's no quoted material that you're actually uh, referring to. You don't want to just talk about your personal feelings about a passage. I'm not saying your feelings are not important, but it's not a reading journal, it's a literary analysis. So the genre is just not appropriate uh, for talking about your personal feelings about a passage. You don't want to offer an analysis that is inaccurate because it contradicts what happens in the novel. Um, and there were a couple of cases um, where, you know, I was, I was dealing with people's close readings either in the exam or in the class discussion. And there were some claims being made that just don't hold up to what's happening in the text. Uh, for example, oh, actually, you'll see an example in the next slide. You also don't want things that are inaccurate due to a lack of connection with the social or historical context. And a tip is to skim the page before and after the passage to re-familiarize yourself with the context in which it appears, which can enrich your insights and help you to avoid inaccuracies. So let's look at an example. This passage is on page 313. I'd like you to go ahead and turn to that page in the Moonstone and you can pause this video for just a second and skim the page that comes before this passage and the page that comes after, just to remind yourself where this passage in the, is in the text, what Franklin knows so far when this happens in the text. So go ahead and pause the video for just a sec, skim, and then you can uh, uh, start playing it again. So after you've looked at the uh, context for this passage. Let's look at this example of someone's close reading. And this is, this is something that is not helpful. This is something I do not want you to do. So let's say this is this person's brainstorming. Franklin knelt down on the brink of the south, south spit. He kneels down next to the shivering sand. This doesn't work because it's merely restating what he did. We already know that he's kneeling down next to the shivering sand. That's not analyzing, that's just restating. The next bullet point, his quote, face was within a few feet of the surface, in parentheses, close to the quicksand. He is close to the quicksand, but this is merely describing what's happening, right? It's not necessarily restating, but it's just describing what's happening. That's not analyzing, that's stating the obvious. Quote, disturbed at intervals, the quicksand is turning. This is another example where someone is actually providing plot summary. They're kind of explaining what's, happened in the what's happening in the text. That is not the same as analyzing what is happening in the text. Um, here's another bullet point, shook my nerves, in parentheses, his feelings. It is true that this quotation is about his feelings, but there's no analysis here. What does it mean that his nerves were shaken? What does that indicate about what he was experiencing? What does it indicate that it was the sand that he's associating with Rosanna? Uh, what does it mean that that's the thing that shook his nerves? The next bullet point, suicide, seeing her rise. Rosanna killed herself and might come back as a ghost. That is, in fact, what he fears. It is explaining, but explaining is not the same as analyzing. The particular words and phrases are not delved into. What's the importance of the word suicide? What's the importance of the phrase seeing her rise? Next, unutterable dread. He's not feeling good about it. Again, this is obvious. Um, the next bullet point, Franklin doesn't want to think about Rosanna. Okay, that seems to be true, but what words and phrases is it connected to? We don't know what's being analyzed. 
The next one, I feel Franklin is being unfair by thinking negative thoughts towards a dead woman. That's this person's feelings, and this would be appropriate for like a reading journal or something like that. But we're trying to analyze here, so that would not be appropriate. And then the last bullet point, Franklin feels, quote, dread because he knows he took the diamond. Does he know he took the diamond yet, though? What is he looking for in the shivering sand? He's looking for that case, right, that he opens and he finds his nightgown and he looks at the name tag and it's his name. So this is inaccurate. This last bullet point is inaccurate. Unless you're saying that subconsciously he somehow has some sort of memory of this and so he's feeling dread because he actually took the diamond. If you want to make that argument, maybe you could justify that. But he doesn't know that he took the diamond yet. He has no idea. Um, so this would not be true that he's feeling dread because of that. So you want to avoid those kinds of inaccuracies. Here's a sample of a strong close reading. It's the same passage. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and read the passage for you. Um, I took up the stick and knelt down on the brink of the south spit. In this position, my face was within a few feet of the surface of the quicksand. The sight of it so near me, still disturbed at intervals by its hideous, shivering fit, shook my nerves for the moment. A horrible fancy that the dead woman might appear on the scene of her suicide to assist my search, an unutterable dread of seeing her rise through the heaving surface of the sand and point to the place forced itself into my mind and turned me cold in the warm sunlight. I own I closed my eyes at the moment when the point of the stick first entered the quicksand. And I asked you to look at the page before and after this just to familiarize yourself with um, what was happening around this passage. And in fact, the first bullet point actually refers to something that came before on page 312. So FB is Franklin Blake uh, looking in the shivering sand for the clue that Rosanna Spearman left for him. Okay, so I'm giving the context. Some of the phrases on page 312, narrow little fissure, thick growth of seaweed, etc., plus phrases in this passage, such as took up the stick, knelt down, and face was within a few feet, sexualize the landscape. Franklin Blake's stick is a phallic symbol and he is forced to confront by kneeling, which is a vulnerable position, uh, with his face, quote, within a few feet, Rosanna Spearman's sexual desire for him. He's being forced to confront her desire um, by getting into this vulnerable position, by using this phallic object to probe um, the shivering sand, um, which is just within a few feet of him. He's having to get uncomfortably close to Rosanna's desire for him. So you can see how took up the stick is being analyzed here. It's not just like he picks up a stick and that's my analysis. My analysis is he is actually, um, because of the way the landscape is described, um, sexualized. And so there's sort of this undercurrent of symbolism going on here. Um, and then that sort of affects how we read his body in this scene in terms of his kneeling down, his face being close, etc. Um, another part of the quotation that's being analyzed, sight of it so near me, still deserved, excuse me, disturbed at intervals by its hideous shivering fit, shook my nerves. So Franklin Blake is uncomfortable with Rosanna Spearman's desire characterized, her desire is characterized as a hideous shivering fit that he cannot stand to have near him. So thus her desire is coded as aberrant and he's unable to handle it. So it's, it's, it's as if her desire is somehow abject, somehow abnormal, somehow disgusting, somehow um, some sort of um, aberration from the norm. Then we've got the quotation, dead woman might appear on the scene of her suicide to assist. So Rosanna Spearman has actually gone to great lengths to help Franklin. So it's interesting that her assistance is being uh, referred to here because she actually is helping him, right? She didn't have to go through all of this trouble to hide this thing in the quicksand with the chain and all the stuff that she did. She's actually done this to help Franklin. And we discover this because he's the one who took the moonstone, right? So we eventually figure out that she's trying to help him because he took it and she wants to protect him. And yet, even though she's done all of this stuff to help him, the idea of seeing her body, which is the repository of her, quote, hideous shivering fit of desire, is terrifying to him. What's actually unsettling to Franklin, which is seeing the ghost of the dead woman, is not what's unsettling to us as the reader. As a reader, we're unsettled because she committed suicide over him to begin with. Like, that's the really disturbing thing, is that he treated her poorly, and she throws herself into the quicksand, and she's dead, and it's this horrible, heartbreaking story. 
what he thinks is disturbing is having to deal with her body, right? That's what he finds disturbing. So you've got a little bit of uh, maybe the beginning of a critique happening. Maybe Collins is sort of challenging the fact that uh, Franklin is so disturbed by Rosanna's desire as opposed to the fact that she killed herself. Then you've got the next quotation. Uh, seeing her rise through the heaving surface of the sand and point to the place. So this part of the quotation reveals that Franklin can only see Rosanna Spearman as an apparent abject holder of illegitimate wayward desire for him that threatens to swallow him up. He, could, he cannot see that in addition to her desire is a bright, intentional, even loving intelligence that did everything it could to protect him. Okay, so how did we get here? Looks like this person is looking at the pointing to the place Pointing to the place would be Rosanna Spearman, reflecting that intelligence, right? She's thinking, she's acting, being strategic. That idea of her pointing and exerting her intelligence and saying, here it is, let me help you. That's the thing that's unbearable to him. Seeing her rise through the surface, that idea of Rosanna rising, that makes her powerful. The idea of her rising up when he's kneeling. Um, and that would mean seeing an intelligent woman and not just her desires, which he dismisses. He talks about her desires as, you know, scary and unsettling. To see her intelligence is too much for him. And so that's the thing that scares him most of all, is the idea of seeing her apparition come up and pointing. Then you've got turned me cold in the warm sunlight. The idea of her intelligence seems so unnatural to him that his body actually responds in an unnatural way. And then closed my eyes at the moment when the point of the stick first entered the quicksand. There's more phallic imagery of penetration going on here. He characterized, characterizes that as almost intolerable and something he cannot bear to see. And it's the fact that he must delve into the quicksand with his stick, which forces him to confront both Rosanna's desire and her intelligence. In other words, if he's gonna use this stick to try to find whatever clue she left for him, He's going to have to confront her desire, which is represented by the heaving, shifting quicksand. That's representing her desire. But he's also going to have to acknowledge her intelligence for putting that chain in there and having that case in there and directing him towards the clue that will lead to the secret of what happened to the diamond. And we know that it's very difficult for him to acknowledge Rosanna's intelligence and her desire together. So you can see how this slide has something very, very different from what was on the previous slide. We've got analysis going on here. It's not just Franklin knelt down, Franklin did this, Franklin did that, I feel this way, or just in parentheses what's going on in the quotation. Those things are not close reading. Now I do want to say that you may not have seen any of these things in this quotation when you read this, and this is actually a very um, well-known analysis of the Moonstone. I had mentioned Tamar Heller's book. She's actually an Ohio scholar too, just like John McBratney. I think she teaches down in Cincinnati. She has a book called Dead Secrets, and it has a fascinating uh, section on the Moonstone um, that I recommend if you're interested uh, in uh, some of the things that we've talked about with uh, Rosanna Spearman. But she actually analyzes the passage on page 312 and 313 um, as sexually symbolic of, Ra uh, Ra excuse me, not Rachel, Rosanna's desire and Franklin's inability to uh, sort of confront that. Um, and there are a few other scholars that have talked about this as well, which is the thing that's really lovely about literary criticism is you may not have thought of something and then you read it and you see it and you realize what, what was going on there. Um, it's fine if when you read this passage, you were not thinking about sexual symbolism, there were no phallic symbols in your mind, that's okay. Um, what I'm saying is that the passages that you choose, the ones that you decide have deeper meaning, I want you to unpack them. I want you to really probe those passages and come out with every single deeper meaning that can possibly come to mind, right? That's what the brainstorming is for. And we know that close reading must be done in a reflective, unhurried, mindful way where you read the passage once, what comes out, read it again, what comes out, glance at the context again, think about it in its context, read it again. Oh, these words stand out now. It's a contemplative act. It's not a hurried act. It's not something that can be done quickly in one shot. Um, so I want you to be really deliberate about the passages that you choose and then try to figure out why they were calling out to you, what it is about those passages that was significant to you. 
Okay, so we talked about how the threads activity involves doing a close reading of five passages. Um, I have tried to be really mindful of workload with this online activity. So I'm not going to ask you to do five passages today because you wouldn't have time. If this uh, lecture and the activity on Blackboard is supposed to be equivalent to a 50 minute class, you're only going to have time for two passages today. So that's what you're going to do. You're going to go onto the discussion board that's on Blackboard. Um, and if you pull that up, you'll notice that there are instructions. You've got the steps that I'd like you to follow for the threads activity. We're not doing the entire threads activity today, um, but you're picking your theme, thread, or critical question. You're writing down what that is, keeping in mind the guidelines that I gave you during this lecture. Then you're selecting two passages and you are doing the brainstorming for them. Again, following the guidelines that I gave in this lecture, making sure you're doing a real close reading of them. And then in the next class session, we're going to work more on close reading and coming up with a claim or a thesis statement to the idea that you're playing around with. Um, because we have an afternoon class, instead of having this due by today at midnight, which I would typically do um, since it's supposed to make up for class, this is going to be due by Saturday night at midnight night just to give you a little more time since we're kind of in the middle of the day um, that way if you need a little extra time to finish up that's totally fine so I've already said what's on the first part of this slide about the homework due by Saturday, September 23rd at 11.59 p.m. If you have questions, please let me know, although I will say that I will be late responding to emails today, Friday, because I have to take care of this injury and get it checked out um, and all of that. So I apologize in advance for that. Um, but as soon as I'm able to be back on email reliably, I will be uh, and will be happy to respond to your emails. I am sad that I am missing Missing the joy of being with you all in class today and, and being just us in the books and then talking about the Moonstone together. Um, so please, again, don't hesitate to contact me if you have questions. It is my pleasure um, to talk with you about the text. And I will see you on Monday. We'll do the Academic Integrity exam on Monday.